Okay, gang, so I'm going to be narrating a, a video I'm putting together, which is a collection of uh, pictures from our Astro 25 uh, field trip to Carrizo Plain, spring 2020. Uh, now I'm using the word our a little loosely. It was really just mine. Sorry for the COVID. And the problem we have with that is that... Uh, you guys were not able to join the trip. That's our problem. Um, yeah, so it was a non-field trip, field trip, unfortunately. Um, so this uh, PowerPoint's the basis for the video of the results of that trip. So what I did is I went down there on the weekend of our trip. Remember our goal was to get the uh, asteroid occultation of uh, the asteroid Neely of a reasonably bright star and reasonably high confidence that the path would go through Carrizo Plain where we set up. And so I still wanted to really do that and also just to show you Carrizo Plain and uh, you know get, give you a little travel log here so that you know what you missed. Alright so I'm gonna pause here and then start a uh, my first video segment. All right. All right. Good morning. I am almost back for our trip. Uh, I used the word hour loosely. Uh, my trip. Uh, off to Carrizo Plain. All right. Well, that's enough for a cool. All right, well, my first adventure was on the drive down. Um, I had been seeing my battery light on for, off and on for a little while. I thought maybe my battery was uh, maybe getting a little old. It was six years old. Uh, I was hoping it was going to be okay for this trip, but unfortunately the battery light on the dashboard was on the entire drive from Santa Cruz down to Paso Robles, which is where I wanted to stop to get gas before I got to Carrizo Plain. Um, since it was on the whole way, I realized I had better not stop at a, a rest stop, for example, because I might need help in getting the car restarted. I might need even to get a new battery. I don't know. So I did wait to Paso Robles, and sure enough, after I filled up and I tried to get going again, the, uh, the battery was not quite powerful enough to turn over the car. So now it could be either the alternator or it could be the battery. But since the battery was six years old and there was just no way I was going to replace the alternator at this point, uh, I made the decision to go ahead and, uh, and get about a mile away. There was an auto parts store and they were open and I did replace the battery. Okay, so then I got back on the road. Um, oh, and by the way, that was with the help of a, a good Samaritan there who um, had just come from L.A. and he was having all kinds of problems with, uh, well, with various things. I, I won't get into all that personal stuff, but um, I, I thank him. And, um, boy, I, you know, I'd have been, it would have been hard. I, I'm really glad he was able to drive me and my battery that mile so that I didn't have to try and lug it and find a place myself. Okay, so back on the road. Uh, I drove east on Highway 46 to um, a turnoff where you could go down on Shell Creek Road to where it intersects with Highway 58. And there is a gorgeous place just north of that intersection on this little one and a half lane road called Shell Creek Road. And that is the best place that I've ever seen for wildflowers in March or April. And a lot of people know about it because you'll see a lot of cars parked down there. And it's private land, but the owners seem to be um, pretty okay with people as long as, you know, they're, they're reasonable and don't leave trash anywhere. And if all they want to do is walk out a little bit, take a few pictures, that's fine. Um, so I stopped and I took a few pictures. It was a gorgeous place. Onward on Highway 58, I got to the north end of Carrizo Plain. And I headed down Soto Lake Road past Soda Lake to uh, this is now the beginning of the road that goes to the uh, the ridge so I hope you can see my my mouse here 
So this is uh, the Caliente Mountains. <clears throat> and this was uh, where we wanted to camp. It was about halfway up, well, maybe a third of the way up into these mountains, roughly right about where my cursor is. And uh, while I was there, I also wanted, as long as I was going to be spending a weekend down here, um, to do something really great, which would would be to do a, uh, a jog, a, a hike slash run along the ridge all the way to Caliente Peak, which you can't really see here, but it's, it's behind this last peak over here. It's a 17 mile out and back run, so it's a bit challenging. And as you can see, you can probably tell that we've had recent rain here, and that was going to cause some problems. So, here we go, problems. Um, I got to the base there where Shelby Ranch is, an old abandoned ranch. I got some nice photos of that you'll see later. And the uh, gate was open so that you could drive up the ridge. However, 50 yards past where the gate was open, there was this mud puddle. And I realize now looking at this photo, it doesn't really look that intimidating. But that was actually all very, very soft mud. And uh, a truck much better equipped than, than me in my RAV4. Um, got stuck, as you'll see later. Okay, I'm going to pause it here, and we'll do a little video. Um, this is where I got to park. Uh, at Selby Ranch. The remains of Selby Ranch. So... I think I showed you for a moment that uh, humongous mud puddle, and after looking at it, I uh, decided there's no way I'm going to get through that. If I get stuck and there's nobody I can call, then um, you know, you might as well just just bury me here. So my new plan is to park here, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to hike up. I'll hike up. Um, I don't know how far I'll get, but I'll get a few miles. Maybe I'll get up to the bridge. And, uh, you know, try and make some lemonade out of these lemons. So, so far, things are challenging, but, you know, um, I'm here. And I do love Cruiser Plain. Let me show you uh, this classic old fence here. I mean, look at that. I just think that kind of thing is really cool. Isn't that cool? All right, well, uh, I'm going to get ready. Okay, so my plan had been to uh, to drive up to the trailhead where there's a, um, the beginnings of altitude high enough that you could really get a, an appreciation of the geology in the region. Uh, remember, we wanted to talk about planetary science. We actually did a lot of that in the uh, earlier lectures for this class but I really wanted to get you some live pictures on the very weekend that we were supposed to be there. So I wanted to get up there, uh, but with the mud puddle, that means I have to, to run all the way up the road to the top of the ridge. So that's, a, that's quite a climb. Um, and for a 67-year-old guy like me, you might think, oh, that's too much. No problem. I am a Santa Cruz Track Club endurance runner, and it did not bother me a bit. But it was going to prevent me from getting all the way to um, to Caliente Peak itself. All right, uh, I'm ready. So I'm going to backtrack, get on the road, um, and uh, head up uh, Caliente Road to the ridge. See how far I get. I think I'm going to leave this behind. Uh, I'll take pictures, and um, I might, e might even shoot a little bit of video on my my little power shop, maybe I can integrate it all together later, but uh, this is a little too bulky to, to bring along, so, uh, all right, well, I'll be back sometime later this afternoon.
So uh, a mile and a half up uh, from Selby Ranch is our campsite. So this is where I wanted our group to camp. Um, I have brought other Astro 25 and Astro 28 uh, field trips to this site over the past, mm, geez, 15 years, I'll bet. Um, it's got a great view of the lake down below, and it's got a great view towards the east of Sunrise. And uh, it's nice and flat and plenty big enough for all of us. So unfortunately, it's just me. And there I am with my foot on the, uh, the camp campfire uh, rocks. It's an informal camp, but it is legal to camp anywhere inside uh, Carrizo Plain if it's up in the mountains. You can't camp down in the plain, but you can camp up in the Caliente Mountains. So another mile or so further up the road, uh, there was a place that looked like it had a well, it was a trail, clearly, going off to the right, and I thought, gee, I wonder if this trail, which heads generally north and therefore a little closer to Soda Lake, might give a better overlook uh, to get some pictures for you for Soda Lake. And so I did uh, go up there a bit, but it turns out it didn't really go very far. Um, ah, miner's lettuce. So this is one of the great delights of doing our spring classes up in the local mountains here. Not so much in the Sierra, perhaps, but in the local uh, lower mountains, miner's lettuce is everywhere. And uh, this is entirely edible. In fact, I love just picking it and, and uh, eating it raw while I'm out there running. It, it tastes delicious. Probably even better with a little bit of uh, dressing, but I didn't have that. Flowers. So this was a good flower season but not a great flower season and it was also a little late. Uh, Carrizo Plain can put on some absolutely dazzling wildflower displays especially if there's been a long drought and then all of a sudden there's a lot of rain. All those seeds that have been waiting for years finally all come out together. So we haven't had that situation for uh, for several years now. So this year there were uh, there were nice flowers I heard in late March here in mid-April the display was already pretty much over but there were some patches that were worthy of some photos. Okay so now I'm back or I'm all the way up to the top of the ridge and I've gotten onto the trail and the actually the first uh, four or five miles of the trail to Caliente Peak is, is um, still a two-lane road because there's a Turns out there's a uh, microwave repeater tower that is on one of the early hills in the range, uh, hilltops. So uh, pretty pretty easy to navigate. Late in the hike, it turns into a single track. So now we're looking off towards the north, and we'll just remind you a little bit about the the geology history, the uh, planetary processes that shaped Carrizo Plain. So Carrizo Plain is right on the San Andreas Fault and there's been separation and there's been a right-left offset. It's a so-called strike-slip fault and on the side that I'm on here well the uh, San Andreas Fault roughly goes along the line that divides uh, the cloud shadow and the sunlit part off their way in the distance. It follows near the base of the other mountains on the far side there, the Tembler Range, so they're not. So the fault itself is not really that close to uh, the Caliente uh, mountain range. Unfortunately, the fault was not really accessible. The the roads were too muddy to to get across and show you, for example, Wallace Creek, uh, like we talked about in the uh, uh, the pre-trip lectures. But um, you can see uh, uh, Soda Lake there, and I just want to remind you because it's got an interesting history. And what's happened is because the the fault is moving at roughly a you know a couple of centimeters a year, but it happens it happens all in big jolts. So there's all of a sudden a whole lot of movement with a big earthquake, and then nothing for maybe a century or two, and then another earthquake, and it's uh, you know a fair amount. And each time there's an earthquake like that, the tilt of the land, uh, which is pretty close to flat, can be enough to tilt uh, suddenly in such a way that the water won't drain out of it anymore. So in the old days, 
long, long ago, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years ago, Carrizo Plain uh, actually did drain to the south down into the uh, Central Valley, and you can see the, the kind of uh, scalloped canyon where that happened. But it doesn't drain anymore because the tilt of the land is such that the water won't go that way. It also won't drain to the north, and so what instead the rain does is it just pools into this large, usually dry lake called Soda Lake. Soda meaning it uh, concentrates the dissolvable metals and so forth in the, uh, and salts in the, the land and then when there's evaporation you end up with a, a dry lake bed. However, t this time it was totally full. I have never seen Soda Lake with so much water in it. Um, this is as full as I've ever seen it and since it wasn't really a heavy rain year it's kind of interesting. We, we did get some late rains in March and early April, and I think that's probably why it filled back up again. We also had some rains in, uh, in fall, but then we had kind of a dry spell this year in January and February. Um, anyway, so there's Soda Lake. You can see the northern boundary up here, and there's the southern boundary down there. And there's a road that goes across this berm here that, if it's not so muddy, is really great to, dr to drive on in the spring because you can see all kinds of wildflowers, you can see the lake really well, but uh, it's, it was uh, un undrivable at this point so we couldn't do that. And then up on top if you look in the other direction, now looking west, you're looking into the Kiyama Valley. So the, the geology of the mountain ranges in this area of California is kind of northwest to southeast oriented mountain ranges with fairly wide valleys in between and this is one of the uh, the ranges that separates those, the Caliente range. So just some colorful stuff that's always great when you're up there in the in the spring. Caliente Peak is exactly a mile high. It's also got an interesting history. Caliente Peak um, was a strategic location in World War II and so they put a, um, a lookout tower up there and they did put a dirt road all the way to the peak so that they could uh, build it and then service it once in a while and they stationed people there with their binoculars and with radio equipment and their goal their mission was to keep an eye out for any Japanese bombers that were going to come in off of perhaps uh, freighters or um, aircraft carriers off the California coast uh, on missions to bomb the the oil fields that are near Taft and Bakersfield. So there's a lot of oil on the other side of the on the other side of the uh, San Andreas Fault and on the far side of the Templar Range. And so they thought that uh, you know that would be a key military target to disrupt our ability to do that so they, they put up a uh, you know an old wooden uh, lookout tower and that was um, standing actually until about the year 2000 and then it finally fell over over its own weight and now it's just a bunch of old boards up there but it is a, a pretty cool place and uh, every time I've been up there I've been alone and that's something I, I really treasure is uh, the ability to, you know, be alone with my thoughts on some long runs or maybe even an overnight uh, camping thing. So I've done both going to Caliente Peak. Now, we had rain the day before, and so my shoes were constantly getting filled with mud. Every step they would get another few millimeters of mud so that within 10 or 20 or 30 feet of, uh, of jogging, my, my shoes would be literally two or three times as heavy as they're supposed to be. Um, so you need strong hip flexors to lift those heavy shoes and unfortunately that's one of my weak points is my left hip flexor so I did get some hip pain on this that uh, unfortunately stuck with me for a few weeks after the trip. Um, now I'm on my way back down because we're getting into the later afternoon. Remember I did lose some time with the long stop over getting a new battery and so forth in Paso Robles and then uh, having to come all the way up the ridge 
So I did not get to the top of Caliente Peak. I only got a few miles along the ridge before I had to turn around. Still got in a good 11 mile run, so that was good. Um, and I'm glad I did not try and shoot this mud puddle. So there's me. There's me parked back there. This is the old Selby Ranch. We'll see some pictures in a minute. And here is a van full of college kids, and uh, they thought, well, we can get through this. And they just gunned it, and all they ended up doing was sinking so deep into the mud, they lost all traction and ended up here. And while there's nobody here to help them at the moment, I was pray hoping and praying that somebody would come along before I got down there. So this is a bit of a zoom picture. This is still a good 20 minutes before I actually got down to this point. Um, so hoping somebody would find them who had the ability to to pull them to safety, and that's exactly what happened. So uh, all's well that ends well. They had a learning experience. So here I am now back at the old Selby Ranch, and uh, you know I told you how much I like that old fence line. So I took a took a photo and played with it in Photoshop and gave it a a real great atmospheric look, old style grainy black and white film kind of look 1930s depression era Ford truck behind the old barn that we showed you so I took another picture of that used a little photoshopping to make it look interesting so Carrizo Plain used to be um, dotted with so-called dry farm branches in other words they didn't use agriculture they didn't uh, try and pull water up for the most part, from uh, the ground, and they just relied on on rain to to water their crops. So it was kind of a low low cost uh, way to do things. And being a little closer to the coast and being a little higher elevation, 2,000 feet, than the Central Valley, then it seemed like uh, you know the way to go. But climate change has slowly dried and warmed the climate, and so dry farming had to be given up. There's still some homesteaders in California Valley, which is a little community just north of Carrizo Plain, and I'm thinking mostly now occupied by people who run the fourth largest solar farm in the world, and that's the Topaz Solar Farm. Uh, but originally there are people who uh, just came out to live, live there, and they, they stayed even though the farming kind of dried up. Okay, let me pause again. Ah. All right. Well, I'm back from my 12-mile uh, hike up into the Caliente Range, which is behind the camera here. I'm here at Selby Ranch. Uh, I had thought maybe maybe I would just stay here and wait for the occultation but this weather forecast I mean this is this is like the worst weather forecast uh, is the worst performing weather forecast I think I can remember and they predicted clear skies today and tonight we've had nothing but solid clouds all day so I'm uh, I'm not optimistic and what I'm thinking is that uh, I should probably head back onto Highway 58. There's another location that would be good to try and record the occultation and it's uh, significantly closer to home. And uh, it's supposed to cloud up in any event by Sunday morning so the Heinemann occultation I'm even less optimistic about. Um, I don't particularly want to camp out in the mud especially when the odds of getting the occultation are so low so what I'm what I think I'm going to do is uh, is head back to a place called um, Red Hill Road and it heads off the uh, dirt road going off toward La, uh, or Pozo rather goes to the little little tiny community of Pozo in the mountains and I'm not going to take it very far I'll just go in for maybe a a mile or so I, as I recall there's a place there that uh, you can pull off and I will at least demonstrate how to set up the equipment and so we can see how astronaut occultations are done without perhaps actually getting one 
On the other hand, if you, if you look off towards the west there, I mean, you might see that I'm reasonably well lit up, and it, it is clearer off in the west, and that's the direction I'll be going. So uh, I think the odds of clear skies might be better there, and it's closer to home, so that if um, the whole thing bails, then, uh, you know, maybe I can get back before midnight and save myself a little bit of time, get some work done. Okay, so... I am going to shift to plan C, I guess. So I'm driving uh, back now uh, away from where Selby Ranch is, but I'm only about a mile from there. And there's these two uh, old, old loading grain storage areas, storage uh, structures that I've never explored before. I mean, I've driven by these for years. I've been coming to Creasel Plain for 15 years. And I've never stopped to get out and examine them. And I actually realized, well, you know, I've got no other responsibilities that are that time constrained that I couldn't just stop and explore these a little bit. So that's what I'm going to do. You know, I've driven by these things probably a half a dozen times over the years, and I've never stopped check them out and so I did uh, since I'm easy on time now um, looks like these are remnants of the day when uh, this place used to be for dry farmers is what they called it so people did try and do some farming here but they didn't have agriculture they didn't have uh, well they didn't have irrigation is what I meant and uh, as the climate dried then they eventually ran out of the ability to do that. Oh, there's a coyote. Oh shoot, I just missed him. Maybe, maybe I can still get him. I think it was a coyote. Oh, there he is. You could see him, but uh, Coyote, very cool. Uh, and then here is another vehicle coming. So I'll have to get out of the road here. But uh, yeah, so anyway, you can see uh, these were tanks. And what happened is uh, they would bring grain, and then the grain they blew with through those through those pipes there up into these, these big bins. And then they dug... Uh, an area underneath so that you could actually drive underneath and pour the grain into uh, place you know into trucks and so forth that would then carry the grain off to, to market and uh, fallen into great disuse of course and so I am going to uh, get out of the road so that this fellow who's about to come up on me is Uh, okay, taken from just a little bit further down the road, closer towards uh, Soda Lake Road that runs down the valley. And so I'm encouraged because I'm now beginning to see a little more sun on the Templar Range. And so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, maybe we're going to get more clearing towards the west and maybe I'll be able to, to get this occultation after all. And then I comment here again that uh, Wallace Creek, which is kind of off to the right beyond the end of the frame here but it's on the far side there at the at the base of the Tembler Range Mountains which is also where the San Andreas Fault is in fact you can probably see um, uh, a trace of the scarp the scarp line here these sort of sharpish cliffs so that's the San Andreas Fault um, so yeah clearer off to the west we call these God Beams. So that's kind of cool. Trying to get my mic working. From the clouds. And uh, we're on the edge now of Soda Lake. I think this is the only time that I've actually seen Soda Lake a lake. I mean, it's essentially completely full. 
uh, if it were completely, completely full, you'd actually see the water coming right up to here. And you can see it's pretty wet. And I can see water right, you know, just 100 yards away. And then the rest of the lake going on for a couple of few miles is, is full of water. So I think we've had more rain here than, you know, than, uh, than I would have thought, you know, given how little we've had in Santa Cruz. Anyway, I, I just wanted to explain, so again, why Soda Lake is here. So the San Andreas Fault runs back there, and as the North America Plate and then the Pacific Plate meet, so we're on the Pacific Plate here, the North America Plate is over there. North America Plate is over there with the mountains, and you can't really see the fault zone from here. But basically, we are we are migrating north, and as we migrate north, the ground kind of does this sort of thing: it goes a little bit this way, and a little bit that way, a little bit this way. And at the moment, it's tilted in such a way that the normal drainage, which used to take the water all the way down the valley, and then it would tumble down past Taft into the well, not Taft wasn't there, okay, but it would tumble down into the Central Valley. Now, the, um, the slope is such that it can't go that way anymore, and it can't go that way either, because that way still slopes up. And so, Soda Lake is really a basin that is relatively temporary. I mean, it might not be here in 10,000, 20,000, 40,000 years, uh, depending on, again, how the, how the land uh, tilts with further motion along the fault. Uh, this particular area along similar similar road, which I was just driving on, can't really drive any further. It's way muddy. It's a it's a kind of road that you can't drive unless it's in the fall. So in the spring, it's really kind of impossible. But you can see some flowers there. You can see some flowers right in front of the camera lens. I'm gonna pick this up and I'm gonna just show you because it's kind of pretty. If this thing will focus, there it is. Try again. Can this focus? Please try. Ah, oh, there we go. To the yellow flowers. Yellow flowers. And in back. Uh, well, the light's changing again, but uh, here you can see. Let's pull back a little bit here so you can see the mountains that's the Timbler range the other side is the side I was climbing in today that's the Caliente range and Caliente Peak you can't really see but you can almost see so I'm zoomed in pretty well but that mountain in the middle of the frame there is not Caliente Peak, but Caliente Peak is right behind it. And so that's a 17 mile run from the trailhead. However, I had to start down at, the, down at the edge of the valley here and hike all the way to the top of the range that you see there. Uh, I, I jogged and ran to the top of that range. So I'm actually quite tired. <laughs> um, not bad for a 67 year old. Oh, look at the god beams. Oh, that is so great. Pull this back. Nice. It can be quite beautiful here. Uh, there are some cars. There's some visitors, definitely visitors. But not really very much in the way of flowers. There's a, there's a few little flowers, again, down around here, next to the lake. There's a couple of patches of flowers on the road that I, I ran up. And that's kind of about it. There may be more flowers deep at the far south end. Uh, I saw a YouTube video. I guess maybe you guys have now too. I did put it on our resource page. Uh, at the south end, it was done just about three weeks ago, actually. And it looked pretty, pretty packed with yellow flowers. But um, all the poppies and the lupin and so forth that I'm used to seeing here on a good year, 
I don't really see those so you know it just kind of depends all right so I'm gonna get back on the road I'm gonna head towards uh, the edge of the National Forest property where there's a dirt road called Red Hill Road that'll take me to a place where I might just uh, cross fingers and hope that hope that I can get this occultation for you guys to see all right okay so this is the path for the Neely occultation so that's going to be our focus now a little bit uh, the blue lines here, so I'm marking them with the, the mouse from there to there. That is the nominal predicted path for the occultation. Now we can't predict these things perfectly for two reasons. First of all, we don't really know the exact size and shape of the asteroid. Uh, they're too small and too far away. That's one of the major reasons why they're so scientifically valuable is to be able to do that, to map out their size and shape by getting a number of observers to, to record the event. Uh, also the positions of the stars and the orbital um, the orbit of the asteroid are not known accurately enough in most, most cases to pin down the path perfectly. So these red lines here bound a larger region and these are the uh, one standard deviation lines. So what this is saying is that this blue path here has a 66 percent chance of happening somewhere between the red lines. Okay, so being somewhat near the center line gives us pretty good odds that we will probably get the occultation. So this telescope is marking uh, my nominal position where I wanted to observe this, which was from just north of Wallace Creek. There's a, a spot I've used before, but it was inaccessible, and also, of course, the clouds look like they would, would clear latest from Carrizo. So my plan instead is to go along Highway 58 here and if you get up to um, right about there the road dips south and you see that it uh, cuts just barely into this green area. This is Los Padres National Forest and if you go from that little spot another couple of miles further south there's a place where I can camp and have a decent view of the horizon, the, the sky and give it a shot from there. So now you can also see that when I made this there were only two observers who were planning to get this occultation. Depends on where the path goes as to who is likely to try it and also how favorable it is. If it's a really favorable and high scientific value target you'll get a decent number of astronomers willing to travel long distances to get to them. Uh, this particular event only had me there I am, and then Paul Maley. Paul Maley is a astronomer uh, living in Arizona. Been doing these things a long time, and he goes almost everywhere. So he uh, has the resources basically to drive wherever he wants. And he uh, he goes after after these things relentlessly, which is of course what we need out of a good scientist. Uh, this is a star map that re reproduces what the the LCD screen on our camcorder, the uh, ZR45 Canon uh, camcorder, um, records the actual input from a much more expensive and much more lower light level video camera called the Watek 910HX. And uh, there's all kinds of great qualities to that. Uh, particular video cam because you can actually have it do in-camera integrations of multiple frames and then output the single frame with a single timestamp on it. And so it allows you to get some very faint events if, uh, if you need to do longer integrations. Okay, so the size of the chip inside the Watek camera covers an area. It's a half inch chip which is not that big but it's bigger than a lot of these video cameras and this is what it covers is this square area here and there's our target star with a little blue cross on it so also on the chart you'll see up here 8 hours 11 minutes 29 seconds that's not time that's actually right ascension that is like longitude measured in the sky 
So these are the coordinates, the two-dimensional coordinates on the sky of that star. So you might think, well, coordinates, why would they use hours, minutes, and seconds? Well, it's kind of a throwback to the old days when we would measure angle across the sky according to how long it would take time to bring that into a fixed telescope that was just sitting and looking at a particular place. So you could uh, you could count off pretty easily and so we we ended up using that and we still use it. it's called right ascension and so there's 24 hours in a full circle of the sky of course you can convert that to degrees if you wanted but there's no real need to all the astronomical instrumentation we need understands right ascension and then below that is declination which is just like celestial latitude it's measured north of the celestial equator with a plus sign so our star is 15 degrees north of the celestial equator 8 hours 11 minutes and 29 seconds away from the vernal equinox the spring equinox in terms of angle that's a position off in the direction of cancer the crab so that was where our target star was and the time of the event is 8.55.00 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time and the duration the predicted duration of the event is only 4.2 seconds so these things don't usually last very long so I'm heading west now on Highway 58 saw this nice little moment so I took a picture and this one I didn't even stop for this I just uh, leaned the camera out the open window while I drove with one hand um, I thought that was pretty and same for this one so now the nice thing about this is the Sun is clearly going through clear skies beneath the clouds so I can't see the Sun it's under the hill but this again was reassuring me as I'm wondering you know are we gonna have clear skies because 855 um, actually it was that was that was wrong in that chart it was actually 955 was the time of the event but that's not that long after sunset and so I was really hoping that we would get these skies cleared up by then so I made it to Red Hill Road. I drove down Red Hill Road for about two miles and I found this little spot. And so this is where I'm going to camp for the night. So I got my tent set up and I'll begin setting up the telescope. And then we're going to see, now I'm going to show a video of me setting up the telescope and talking you through it. Unfortunately, the video camera that records um, not the sky but records us is not a low light level camera and uh, so it turns out you can't see very well but you can hear very well so I'm going to do that now all right we are now one hour away from the Neely occultation so it's time time to get this thing going so I've set up at a location um, it's in Los Padres National Forest just off Highway 58. Uh, I found a nice little camp spot. My tent's right over there. And um, it's got a great view of the sky and all the clouds that I've been complaining about all day. Uh, they're gone. It cleared away. Um, I, I think it might even be clear in Carrizo Plain. Um, but it looked like it might not be. And that's why I went ahead and came out here. So now we got to do the first things and the first thing is to get the mount on so here's our mount fits on the tripod this is a Celestron 8SE 8 inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. Um, I like it a lot. It's pretty lightweight. Uh, it points pretty well when you do your two star alignment if you do it properly. It's got this uh, nice three bolt connection so that's real solid. 
the old Mead telescope that I used to use for these things um, just was always breaking and giving trouble and so far I'm, I'm pretty happy with the Mead SE uh, it's been great alright so we have the mount on now here's the thing it's pretty moist out okay we we've had rain we've had rain uh, you know off and on for for several days it's reasonably dry here the ground grounds reasonable it's not muddy like it was back at Carrizo um, however it is I mean I can see moisture condensing on my tent as I was relaxing a little bit before I came out here and a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope has a corrector plate it has a little glass plate on the front end of the telescope and that just sits out open to the air and when you have a clean sky like this then there is less uh, cloud cover and this and the corrector plate sees a, a very cold sky and so that's when you get dew forming on surfaces and uh, the problem with dew forming like you know if dew were to form right before occultation not a whole lot I can do about it because I, I don't have um, I mean if I were at home I could uh, power up an AC hair dryer but you don't have enough power out here to power a hair dryer so I'm a little hesitant to pull the scope out until uh, the last moment so but I have got most of the stuff going here already so I've got the tripod on I'm just going to sort of explain the process um, so let's uh here i'm going to take this so we can both look at the occultation so at, at home i'll make up these prediction sheets you see and the prediction sheets they show the path of Neely. Actually, uh, I showed you this during the uh, pre trip meeting a week ago. Got all the relevant things. Got the coordinates, the longitude and latitude in the sky, which we call right ascension and declination. It's also got the right ascension and declination as they are on tonight. So, to find it on a star chart, you need to use the coordinates as they were in the year 2000, because that's the way star charts are done these days. Um, but if you want to actually find it in the telescope, then you'd better give it the proper RA and deck for tonight. So that's kind of the way you need both of those. Um, so I hope you can see that. Uh, looks like maybe you can. And so there's the path going right across South Central California at 9. So 4 hours universal time. We've got to subtract 7 to get daylight saving time on Pacific Coast. So that is 9.55, 9.55 p.m. It's now 9.04. So we have 50 minutes until the occultation. And so the first chart I made up is a, a chart that shows what it will look like in the eyepiece. We use the Q70 Orion 32 millimeter eyepieces. They give a nice wide field of view. And they're not super expensive hundred bucks or something and so there we go 855 excuse me that should be 955 uh, p.m. and uh, so let's go for it so the other piece of equipment that we have is power underneath here this is my aux box and the power connects to our camera and we kind of like to turn this on early because we want the GPS unit which is inside of the IOTA um, video time inserter we want it to go ahead and uh, 
find satellites and get happy finding exactly what it needs and that may take up to 15 minutes especially if we've moved it which we certainly have we're nowhere near Santa Cruz so uh, the thing is I don't want to hot plug our camera this camera here is a $700 camera very low light level camera it's got lots of options you can do you can have it integrate over time inside the camera before it dumps the image to whatever uh, screen that you're looking at it with so that's really convenient for dim stars so I can get occultations all the way down to 14th magnitude with this guy that's pretty darn dim but what I want to do is get the camera powered get the power plugged in before I turn on so I'm reaching down here and I'm gonna find the power so I've turned on the power and now I'll double check and the IOTA VTI is going to start to acquire and I think I've done about all I can without pulling the scope out so let's pull the scope out still what I'll do is I'll leave the cap on the front end for as long as I can again you don't don't want this thing to fog up or otherwise you're in big trouble so there's a dovetail on the end of the scope and you slide it in here and then you tighten it down really be better if you had three hands but I've been okay with two and then the back end here this is the inch and a quarter adapter we will use that later but for right now what we need is to put some other stuff on we need to put on the laser sight so this sends a little uh, LED a red LED light project it onto a screen that looks at the sky so there's no magnification to it but it's it's really great because it shows you exactly where you're looking and and all we're going to use that for really is to uh, to align the telescope so um, I think the next thing we want to do is get the telescope powered So it's a 12 volt system, 12 volt battery, which I charged up when we we're still at home. So I plug that in, plug it in to the arm, turn on the power. seem to want to turn on as easily as I hoped let me try this one plug it way down deep in there we go now it's happy so I think what I want to do what do we got so it's nine ten make sure we got this right so nearly occultation is at four hours 
and in Pacific Daylight Time that is 9 so we got 9.55 so that, that looks about right 9.55 So what we want to do is put on now the back end so that we can do a two star alignment. So this telescope has a little computer that I'll show you in a minute. And the computer knows all, all it really needs to know in order to find anything you might want to find. But it does need to know where it's pointing. It does need to know its orientation, it needs to get its bearings as you were. So what we have to do is put on a two inch eyepiece. We use the Orion Q70. Thirty two millimeter. And the little circle I showed you on the map a moment ago is exactly the circle that corresponds to what you see in this eyepiece. Okay, so we are now ready to uh, to align the scope. So what what that means is we have to point this to two stars that this telescope knows, and that it knows that you, that you're pointing at those two stars. Now, since the sky is a two-dimensional surface, then that's all you need. You give it two points and you got two equations and two unknowns and you can solve the system. And then the other thing it needs to know is how fast does the Earth rotate? Well, duh. One full period in 24 hours, no problem there. So it knows everything it needs to. And all you need is to make sure that you know, you've know you set it so that it doesn't uh, have trouble that way. Move this a little closer. And uh, the other thing is our camcorder. So this is the camcorder. This actually is also sensitive to cold. So I think I might just wait a little bit. I'm going to leave this. If it's too cold and too damp, this also gets unhappy. And, and it might look like it's working when it really isn't recording. I had that happen to me once years ago. It was very uh, disappointing, to say the least. So, uh, what else can I tell you while we're waiting? We still got 40 minutes till the event. I certainly don't want to uncap the scope. I don't need all that time. So, I think what I'll do is I'll um, I'll just uh, do a little narration here. So, now. I know the camera. Well, the camera's not seeing anything, is it? Okay, so there's our scope. Um, turn on the little laser sight here. So we'll click. Now it's on. Click. Now it's off. Got the cap on the front, so that's good. Um. Yeah, so, so the basic idea that we're going to be doing in maybe another 15 minutes is I'm going to aim it at two stars. I'm going to choose Polaris just because it's nice and it's far away from typically any other occultation uh, situation that you might have. It's far from the ecliptic. And, um, and then I'll also aim it probably up there at Regulus bright star and Leo those two stars are quite far apart you know they're like and that's what you want to get a good alignment then what I do is I tell the uh, the telescope okay now I want you to go to these coordinates and you'll see that the telescope will just go there and I'll look in the eyepiece and I will make sure that what I see looks a lot like what I see here and what you want to do is um, is look here and see if you find some pattern. And it's like, oh yeah, there we go. There's a 
double star pretty bright another star off there so that would be my pattern here's another very tight double star there that's decently bright and so that's how I would try to zoom in and, and then find my target star which is that one right there and then what I'll do is I'll get that centered in the eyepiece maybe in fact I'll get the double star centered and then I'll flip to the next page and this page is what you would see on the LCD screen and the LCD screen on the camcorder will show a much smaller view because the chip in the uh, Watec 910HX is smaller certainly than the field of view in the eyepiece and so that double star that we talked about before is up here and the other double is uh, somewhere else. Oh, it's way over here. Um, yeah, so I'll probably try and find uh, these two guys, and then I'll just go straight down, since that is such an obvious thing. And then I'll just uh, drive the telescope straight down, make sure it tracks, and then I'll just... All right, sorry for the phone, phone call interruption there. So I'm, I'm back and I actually rewound the video a little bit so I'll just start it from uh, a few seconds earlier. The quarter will show a much smaller view because the chip in the uh, Watec 910HX is smaller certainly than the field of view in the eyepiece. And so that double star that we talked about before is up here and the other double is uh, somewhere else. Oh, it's way over here. Um, yeah, so I'll probably try and find uh, these two guys and then I'll just go straight down since that is such an obvious thing. And then I'll just uh, drive the telescope straight down, make sure it tracks, and then I'll just wait. So the drop in magnitude you can see here Hope you can see that 5.1 magnitudes that's like a factor of a hundred so basically this this star which is you know as stars go is uh, kind of mm, middling brightness 11.0 uh, in a dark clean sky like this that'll be no problem at all even with very low integration and it's going to basically disappear altogether 5.1 magnitudes um, for up to 4.2 seconds might be a little less my guess is it'll probably be three or four seconds now we're reasonably close to the center line here so the odds are very high that we'll have an occultation but sometimes these paths shift a lot and then then you're uh, you know I have been disappointed I've been well inside the path and said this is a sure thing and then I get a miss um, but you know if you knew exactly what you're gonna see I mean exactly exactly well there'd be no point in doing these because the whole the whole point of doing these is to get better orbits for the occultation asteroid and to perhaps determine if the star maybe the star is an, uh, a double star that hadn't previously been known I hate to look at the camera when I've got this super bright light on, so I think I'll pull this off and just hold it here. Uh, here, I can put it back up here. Maybe it'll show me okay. Um, uh, yeah, and of course we want to know the shape of the asteroid. So maybe to remind you of some things that we, we talked about last week. So the, the scientific value in doing these things is the exact shape of the asteroid can tell you something about the history of asteroids and what you want is a large statistical base and we're, we already have a base that is is showing that most asteroids that are bigger than a few kilometers across are reasonably round but that's not always true and smaller ones can be very irregular and those then we know must be just solid bodies chunks of rock maybe chunks of ice but they're they're not pulled into the tightest possible shape which is a sphere and if most of them are round when they're large that argues that these 
used to be molten perhaps in their early history or that they are rubble piles. So we still want to really understand the history of the asteroids and why why they came to be uh, what they are. So there's there are different theories out there. Are they just debris that slowly collected and never fell onto a planet? Or are they pieces of once larger planets that orbited between Mars and Jupiter and hit each other and caused, uh, especially for the collisions that might have been a little gentler, they might not have molt, uh, made the asteroids actually melt, in which case um, you could have big chunks floating around, uh, or a mixture of those two. Um, asteroids that are very round are probably made of sand, dirt, pebbles, things that will you know, slide around onto each other so that they can still pull themselves into a round shape. Um, okay, so what do we got? We are at 921. So I think I want to go ahead and get this thing aligned. So I turn on the red light, turn this on, And what I want to do is first aim this thing towards the North Star, well, towards the North Horizon. So to get the best alignment, the instructions are to aim this thing first at the horizon right below the North Star. The North Star is actually uh, straight behind you if you're watching this on camera. So I'm going to have to aim the scope pretty much right at the camera. Doesn't have to be perfectly on the northern horizon, but somewhere close is good. So then I push enter. And, oops, no, I don't want to do that. Um, we need to start over. So what we want to do is do the two-star alignment, auto two-star alignment. So it needs the time. The time is 9.22.45, which is 21.22.45. Enter. Daylight saving time. It is uh, April 18th, so that is 04, 18, 20, enter, select star, okay, so I am going to go down to Polaris, Enter. Now I'm going to walk around. And I got to aim this eyepiece and get Polaris centered in the eyepiece. I'm going to skip forward here a little bit to the final minutes before the occultation event. All right. So, uh, yeah, I had a little, I had some issues there, but you know what? We've always got issues. Uh, and the issues is that over here, see where that connector goes into the inside? Connects to the computer, little hand computer. Yeah, well, I found that if you tug on that even a little bit, it can lose contact, and that was why I was losing power. I lost power like three or four times. That's why I had to um, turn this off so I could focus and get back going. Uh, but we're, we're in good shape now. We have eight minutes until the occultation. Uh, and that star, which maybe you can see right in the middle, slightly, slightly above the middle, that's our target star. 
So the next thing I want to do is make sure that we're integrating at a time that will give us a good time resolution. So I'm going to have to put this down, but maybe you can watch while I do that. So what I need to do is push the little button here. Actually, you know what, I think I'm going to, it's drifting, I think I'm going to make that go down just a bit. I really want to keep that centered. And I need those other two stars because uh, those look like excellent stars for tracking. I am going to need a tracking star because this thing is going to entirely disappear. Probably I'll use that guy to the upper left that you saw as my tracking star when I do the uh, software reductions which I will do when I get home. Okay, beginning the tape for the occultation by the asteroid Neely. I'm going to turn back on again in a minute, so hang on. Okay, that's about where I want it. I'm going to leave this here. Now, what I want to do is I want to change the integration. That's kind of touchy. You have to. I'm going to turn this light off actually. I'll make it red. Have to push this little button here. 8x. I bet I could do. Uh, so that's four frames per second. I'll bet I could do. Uh, Four. Now, can I still see it? Yes, barely. Okay, so <clears throat> the uh, last uh, few minutes were <laughs> frustrating, and um, I, I don't have those here, but we, we had dew forming on the front of the corrector plate. It was very cold and very wet that night, and uh, unfortunately, um, with the low integrations that I chose, I wasn't able uh, to, to see it, and nor to to recover back to larger integrations. So what I should have done is just left it alone. I should have just left it at 8x integrations. Um, it was getting, time was getting too short, too much time spent narrating and being an actor and videographer and not enough time being an astronomer. So uh, we did not get that event. Now, after I'd scheduled this class, I realized there was another event. How often do you get that? In fact, the second event by the asteroid Heinemann was um, almost exactly the same path. So all along it, there was actually uh, the possibility of getting two events in one night. So I've never done that before, gotten two successful events in one night. Uh, this was by the asteroid Heinemann. This was mm, a slightly dimmer, but about the same, 11.2 magnitude. That's decently bright. Uh, it was at 3 in the morning, so that was difficult. Um, but after the disappointment of uh, Neely, I did try and get some sleep. And I did get up. And, um, yeah, so I'm going to pause here. All right, gang. We're back on the air. For the occultation of an 11.2 magnitude star by Heinemann and the stars in Libra just to the left of a decent, decently bright star uh, Alpha Libra and uh, just to the right of Scorpio 
um, a great star red super giant so there's there's where we're looking there's our target star that little teeny dim star right there and uh, I've got the cap back on so this time you know once I forget the saying <laughs> it's three in the morning um, twice shy anyway once burned twice shy something like that I will remember this time to pull the cap off okay so there is our target I'm going to be aiming at the moment at this bright star so I can get it focused. You need to change the focus from where it is focused in the eyepiece to where it's focused for the the uh, camcorder, the Watek camera. The occultation is in mm, 17 minutes and I guess just to review I'm not sure how much of the earlier tape I'm gonna cut because it's a little chaotic but uh, so we have this consolation prize and that's Heinemann and you know we could get it, it we could get this but the problem is that uh, the odds of a hit are only uh, 20 percent so the path accuracy is poorer for this occultation this this asteroid is smaller and the ast and the orbit is more poorly determined and while we're inside the nominal path still the odds of a, of a hit are only about 20 percent so 80 percent chance that I'm just going to get a miss but even that might be instructive I will after all it's a learning event right it's a learning event and uh this is not going to torpedo the progress of planetary astronomy, right? Okay, so the whole world is not depending on me. This is uh, just another event. So, we are now at 2.57. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead, uncap it, and we're just going to have to hope that it doesn't do up, because I really need... To make sure I don't blow this one. 910 HX video cam. I got to make sure and orient it right so there's a little wheel that's got to be dead right and the rest has to be aimed straight up and the reason that we do that is so that the star field will look just like it's supposed to because what you don't want to be doing is messing around trying to invert and pervert the image of the mind and flip it back and forth to try and match the star fields. You need to know exactly what you're looking at when you're looking at it. All right, we've got seven minutes to go. It would be a lot less nerve-wracking if it were drier but this is about the wettest conditions I can think of all right so we need to now crank this to the left to focus our stars there we go there's a nice bright star in the middle let's get my star chart doesn't look exactly like I thought it would. Well, 
well the occultation's in 15 seconds I don't know whether it's on here or not I suspect it's not but uh, it might it might be the star right above the uh, the numbers I've got it on pretty high integration well if there was an occultation it would have happened I don't see any star that disappeared all right well uh, the disappointing aspect of the Heinemann occultation was the, the telescope had now been out there for uh, five hours in 35 degree temperatures at 99 percent humidity uh, everything was soaked to the bone and I think the uh, the electronics were affected and it wasn't tracking well and uh, so th the the tape that I did get it, it didn't have the star on there is the bottom line so rather than spend more minutes on that which was unfortunately another way that these things can go wrong uh, th these are these are valuable and interesting and uh, important events but boy there are <laughs> there are so many things that can go wrong and uh, I've been meaning to put together a list that would kind of like make a batting average and, and also a, a list of all the things that can go wrong there's a book waiting for somebody who does astro astronaut occultations to to list every possible thing that can go wrong it's one of the things that the iota astronomers do talk about after the events um, we even have some funny names for some of them. I won't, I won't name them because often they're named after people, and so we won't do that. But uh, uh, anyway, we did not get data on either of the events, so the Heinemann occultation was also a no data event. Uh, doesn't mean that um, we don't have something to show you, though. So we are going to. Uh, show you the reduction of an occultation and I also want to show you sunrise because that was kind of cool um, this is from my campsite uh, not too long after I'd gotten packed up the um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go on to a different tape a different uh, tape that I put together showing how you reduce these asteroid occultations how you take the data and you run it through software and turn it into uh, real data okay so you use some uh, some software that's free it's called live movie and then you use another piece of software called Pyote, which is a, a reduction program that finds the, the timing the D and the R the disappearance and reappearance of the star the exact time right down to as good a fraction of a second as you can split using the satellite uh, GPS when PPS time signals and so we'll do that though on a separate tape so I've, I've already uh, been working on that tape and I'm going to be doing that uh, and, and also linking it on your page but for now that's what we got okay so you got to see the whole thing warts and all so we had our good moments we had our bad moments and uh, but you know what life carries forwards <laughs>